has happened is our speakers have malfunctioned today. And so uh, we're just going to have to work around that the best, the best we can. We, we still have... And all we know about them is the scripture says they offered up strange fire. Doesn't even necessarily qualify what that fire may be. What made it necessarily strange. But what they, the Bible does tell us is they're instructed not to do so. And at that moment... The Bible tells us a fire came and consumed them. And they died. It's almost one of those stories where we step back and say, God, that, that seemed a little harsh. That seemed a little unfair. Now, if you were in small group time, you understand what led up to the story, but for the sake of everyone else around us and, and for the sake of those that will be tuning on YouTube later on, let's back up in the story. Let's go back one full week. The book of Leviticus picks up where Exodus leaves off. Israel has constructed the tabernacle, a place where they're going to meet with God and worship Him there. And 
God's glory comes down from the Mount Sinai down into the tent. And it fills the tent. The Bible says Moses cannot enter into the tent because of the glory of God. And and God's giving instructions on how Israel is to function with him dwelling in their midst. He gives some offerings that we looked at last week. How they're to bring things before God's presence in either, and the purpose either to be to make atonement, a sinless sacrifice, dying as our representative, or simply to say, thank you, God. I praise you. I worship you. And then, after God gave instructions for the offerings, they needed to prepare people to do the work of actually offering the offerings. Enter the priests. Exodus tells us it would be Aaron and his sons. They would be the priests before the Lord. And in Exodus chapter 8 and 9, God gives a prescription to, to consecrate the high priests, to set them apart. And then they have an ordination service. At the consecration, the priest, they, the Aaron and his sons, they bring an offering before the Lord. It uh, starts with a bullock, a, a bull for a sin offering. They offer this animal up to atone for sins that they have committed unintentionally or unaware of. And then they have another offering, a ram that is given as a burnt offering, as a, a, an atonement. And then a third offering. This one's different than what's laid out in like Leviticus 1 through 7. This one's a consecration offering. It's a ram, and, and they take this animal, and they kill this animal. And, and Moses comes, and he dips his finger in the blood of the animal, and he, he puts it on the right ear of Aaron and his sons, and on their right thumb, and, and on their right big toe. And that's really odd. <laughs> that's really weird in our context. But there's some powerful symbolism there. We sang today, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. In this context, in this symbolism here, this blood of the innocent animal is offered as a spiritual cleansing. And Aaron and his sons were being spiritually cleansed, spiritually set aside for a specific task. Their ears were to hear the words that God commanded Moses. To know the instructions. And as God will lay out, to teach them in all of Israel. Their hands were to be set aside, set apart for doing the work. To do the offerings. To kill the lambs and the, 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 the bulls and the, the rams and the doves. To, to bring them as uh, burnt sacrifices. To take the grain offering and cast that upon the altar. To do the ministry. Their feet were to be set apart because their feet would carry them through the camp, into the court, past the uh, laver, past the altar, into the tabernacle itself, the holy place where the table of showbread was where the golden candlestick was, where the altar of incense. And then once a year, the high priest himself would go beyond even the holy place into the most holy, the holy of holies. And there, as we will see eventually, on the day of atonement, he would offer blood upon the mercy seat, the top, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. They were being consecrated set aside, put apart for a special purpose. I think we could illustrate it in this way. When you were a kid, you had toys that were special toys, weren't they? You had toys that were average toys. The special toys, you didn't let just any old you know, chump off the street come and play with them. I mean, your best friend, maybe. They were special. And when they they played with that toy, I mean, you were were paying attention. You were watchful. You wanted to make sure they didn't do something dumb. 
with your special toy. It was set apart. Now, some average McDonald's uh, Happy Meal toy, I mean, you know, any kid off the street could have launched that through a catapult or thrown it down the stairs. You wouldn't have cared. But your special toys, those ones, they, they were set apart. They were consecrated for your use. This is what God was doing with the priests. They were set apart. What's interesting, Israel itself was a set apart people. The whole nation was to be consecrated from, f for the Lord. And then from this holy, chosen, consecrated people, God called one tribe, the tribe of the Levites. And from the tri tribe of Levi, he called one family. Aaron and his sons to be the priests. I mean, these guys were the chosen of the chosen of the chosen. Extra special. Extra consecrated. Extra set aside. They could not do with their lives whatever they choose haphazardly. Their ears were not for hearing profane things. Their hands were not for doing iniquity. Their feet were not for carrying them into all sorts of wrong, unclean places. They were gods. Belonged to him. They were anointed. In fact, in the uh, opening of Leviticus, we are told uh, Moses is given instruction. He says, take Aaron and his sons with him in, in uh, Leviticus chapter 8, verse 2. And take the garments, the, 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 the priestly outfit. And take the anointing oil and a bullock for the sin offering and two rams and a basket of unleavened bread. And gather thou to all of the congregation together under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. This was going to be a special moment. They even pulled out this special oil. It's described in Exodus. In chapter 30, verses 23 through 25, uh, the, the recipe is to take principal spi spices of myrrh and cinnamon and, and calamus and, and, and cassia and a mix olive oil and that one oil was to be a holy ointment it could be used for nothing else but for sanctifying special things setting apart special things the furniture of the tabernacle was anointed with this oil the priests themselves would be anointed with this oil when the priests are consecrated a sacrifice was made something costly was given up and then they were told to to sit apart to camp out at the door of the tabernacle for seven days you picture just being an israelite for those seven days You've heard Moses give instruction on these offerings that are be given by faith. And you see now this, this priest. And the priest, he's going to get to go to God be, you know, on your behalf. He better be up to the job. <laughs> because offering the sacrifices for your atonement fall on his hands. Can you, can you picture being an Israelite? during that week walking by checking on, on, on Aaron hey Aaron you doing your job there Aaron Aaron listen man you got me buddy you gotta be there it was a it was a moment of great importance that week was probably a very sobering week it was a week of great anticipation And then the end of the week comes. Where the priests are ready. The offerings have been made. They have been consecrated. They have been set apart. And they begin to do the work. Aaron begins to offer up sacrifices. He does some for himself, and then he does some sacrifices for the people. Of the five offerings we looked at last week, Aaron offers up four. He offers a burnt offering. He offers a sin offering. He offers a grain offering. He offers a peace offering. 
It is a moment of worship when the whole congregation involved. And when Aaron is done doing the work, he offers up those sacrifices. And notice in, in verse number nine, I mean, sorry, in chapter number, number nine, all the way at the end of the chapter, in verse number 23, and Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle. I didn't get to emphasize this during our small groups because there's so much time to, in what we did dig into. But what was the problem that they had before? Aaron, uh, Moses couldn't go in. The glory of the Lord had filled the tabernacle. They could not do the work. God could not dwell in the midst of his people and they could not meet with him yet. But now the offerings have been made. Now atonement had been given. And now, finally, the priest and Moses, they take that first step into the tent. They go into the holy place. They do the offering within the holy place. And then they come out of the tabernacle. Notice in verse 23. And they bless the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came out a fire uh, from before the Lord and, and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. It was a spirit, I mean, it was a divine thumbs up made with fire. They did everything God told them to do. In fact, in chapter 8 of Leviticus, as Moses is preparing the priests, seven times we find a repeated phrase, as the Lord commanded Moses, as the Lord commanded Moses, as the Lord commanded Moses. I mean, they were obedient. There was a great emphasis on this because the priests were to be set apart, consecrated, holy. Therefore, there, the work of ordaining the priests was to be obedient. And then when Moses and Aaron, or rather when Aaron offers up these sacrifices, he does it as God prescribed in Leviticus 1 through 7. He was obedient. They did everything that God had told them to do. They were careful to be faithful to God's instructions. Because they had a sacred task. They had a holy job. They had a special position. And that brings us back to Leviticus chapter 10. These two sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, they get in their idea, in their mind, hey, we should do something. I mean, dad and and, and, and and Moses, I mean, they got to go into the, tab the tabernacle. They went into the holy place. I mean, God's presence is here. The glory is here. The people have, have fallen on their faces. It's a, it's a great moment of worship. This is really great. This is awesome. Let's go before God. Let us go into the holy place. Let us offer up an incense. Let's do it our way. Let's do what we want to do. And that's when the fire comes out. And Nadab and Abihu are consumed in a moment. What do you think is going through Aaron's mind? As a father, I love my boys. I love God. And I want them to love God and to serve God. And here they are trying to serve God in their own way. And God kills them? God destroys them? I would be looking for some answers, wouldn't you? Moses gives answers. He says here in verse number 3, this is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. Before all the people, I will be glorified. It was no light thing. 
it was not a trivial matter. You say, well, they just offered fire up. Yes, but who are they going before? God desired of his high priest? No. God expected of his high priest's obedience. God expected of his high priest to do the work of the ministry as he had instructed them to do. He did not expect, he did not intend, rather, let me put it this way, he had no desire for them to hijack the worship of him and draw the attention to themselves. And that's exactly what they did. And when Aaron hears these things, and God says, I'm going to be sanctified in those that draw near me. If you're going to come to me, I'm going to be sanctified. And through you, in the sight of all the people, I'm going to be glorified. When Aaron hears these things, the Bible tells us Aaron holds his peace. Because Aaron understands that God is just and whatever it is that he does. Now, from a human perspective, it may seem unfair. It may seem like such a small thing. From a human perspective, even if we're, if we're not careful, we may even uh, uh, look at what God does here and say, man, God, you threw a temper tantrum. God, you acted kind of like a narcissist here. But again, that's through human eyes. That's through eyes and we look at ourselves and say, well, you know, uh, we, we, we describe narcissism, somebody who's trying to draw glory and draw attention when he's not worthy of it. But God is worthy of all honor and all praise and glory because he's the creator. God is holy. He has made it very clear to them over and over and over again. And so Aaron understands this thing that God is just. Let's draw the conclusions we need from the New Testament here. We look at the story, we consider these truths, we consider these facts about Scripture, about God and who He is and, and who His servants are and who the priests are. We're reminded some things about ourselves. We're reminded of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that say, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but ye, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God in the Old Testament only the priests were allowed to come before God and offer up a sacrifice only the sons of Aaron only the Levites but now in the New Testament we teach the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers that through Jesus we have been made able to come before God. We have direct access to God through Jesus Christ, His Son. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible tells us that the veil in the temple, which has been the same veil that was in the tabernacle, that part that separated the common Israelites from the holiness of God, that veil was rent in two. It symbolized that now man no longer was separated from God because of sin, but couldn't have access to God through the sinless work of Jesus Christ. Peter tells us that we, we are a holy priesthood, a holy nation. It says, wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies, and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be that ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God 
and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. God expected great things of Moses and Aaron. He expected obedience of them because he was holy and just and righteous and pure. In like manner, he has called us to do the same. Now, you don't have to be worried. You're not going to walk out these doors and God's going to smite you with a thunderbolt every time you do wrong. He is still very merciful very long suffering he made a point with Nadab and Abihu he taught a truth with them they was very gracious he's been very patient God is not a vengeful deity with a baseball bat ready to smack you whenever you've done wrong that's just not who he is he's a loving and kind heavenly father But it's not wrong for a father to expect obedience of his children. Contrary to our culture, which our culture has this mindset that like any rules are restrictive and rules are bad because rules tell people what they can and can't do. Some rules are very good. You know, we have a rule with my children, particularly with my older son, because the younger son's typically in our arms. My older son, we have a rule. We call it the parking lot rule. In a parking lot, the rule is he holds a hand. Why? Because the little stinker loves to run. He loves to play when he's outside. But he's also just the right height that somebody with a big, tall truck can't see him. We love our son. We don't want to see him destroy himself. We don't want to see him get hurt, so we've put a rule. And we expect obedience to that rule. Is God any different? So the, the emphasis, the, the point I'm trying to make today in this whole sermon is that God wants us to be obedient to his commands. Just as he expected of the Old Testament priests, so he expects of New Testament ones. Now we don't serve in the same capacity that Aaron and his sons did. Jesus Christ offered this sacrifice and once for all. But now we offer up our spiritual offerings, praises, gifts of, uh, uh, you know, uh, of tithes and offerings. Uh, we, 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 we do the offering of our own lives, as Paul said. We give ourselves to, to be servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we are his, then we saw in Romans chapter 12, then our lives ought to be acceptable to him. not conform to this world not living in the same philosophies that this world has as Peter pointed out in his uh, past scripture and oftentimes we talk about as pastors and preachers being separate from the world and saying oh yeah we are not follow you know smoking and drinking and, 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 and rabble rousing and drugs and all that but notice what Peter says he takes it even a step further and he says let all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking put those things away Isn't it sad when we think of Christianity today that those are the kind of things that the lost world around us equates to Christians? People who are full of malice. Can't get along. We hate each other. You know, we do everything. We, like, we may even come to the same church but sit on, on different corners of the room to avoid talking to each other. Full of hypocrisies. We say we believe one thing, and by action we do something totally different. Full of envy. Well, my ministry isn't as big as so-and-so's ministry. Our church doesn't have what the church across town has. Well, I can't believe he's driving a fancy new car. I should deserve that. I mean, if he were more godly, he would give more money to the church and be driving a hoopty like I am. 
Do we not say those things? Priests, you're not for that. Your ears are not for profane things. Your hands are not doing, for doing things that are contrary to God's word. Your feet are not for taking you places that you don't belong. You are holy. You are consecrated. You are set apart for the glory of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The one who loved you so much that he dipped his own uh, soul into, into destruction for our sakes. He died on the cross for us. He took all of his father's wrath for us. He faced all of the justice for us that we might be made righteous in his sight. That we might, who were before criminals, be turned to being holy sons of God. God. So I must ask you, are you living as a holy sacrifice? Are you this New Testament priest who's offering up spiritual sacrifices to God, the sacrifices of obedience, faithfulness? How do we do that? How can we truly be faithful and obedient in all things? Number one, I'll give you four things to apply what we've learned and will be done. Number one, become a student of God's word. It's kind of hard to know what God has told us to do if we never actually read his instruction manual. I've illustrated the Bible in this way many times. How many of you grew up playing with Legos? Yeah, Matthew. Matthew inherited our Legos and added to his Legos. If you bought Lego sets, each Lego set, besides the pieces needed and the million packages you had to open, it came with something very, very important if you wanted those pieces to look like the thing on the box. And that was the... And if you ever broke that set that you built and wanted to build it again... It was really hard to do if you no longer had the... I remember one of the last Lego sets I was ever given. It was, it was one of the best Lego sets I was ever given. It was this $100 castle. I mean, the thing was so involved, it came with two sets of instructions. I also had a little brother at the time who was very much into horses and toy animals and thought that the Lego horses that came with the castle would make the ultimate comets to come down from outer space and smash the castle to a million tiny pieces. Talking to you, Matthew. He did this one day, one fateful day, and when I went to the box to find the instructions, I found half. The other half was never seen again. I could never rebuild that castle the way it was designed to look by the designer, the creator of the Lego set because I did not know what the instructions are. And so also your life can never look like the way God intends for it to look like. Your life can never truly be acceptable unto God if you don't know what his instructions are. But we live in a day and age of biblical illiteracy. The average Christian doesn't know God's word. We just follow by whatever you know, latest wacky TikTok video or YouTube video we find that tells us what God's word said. And we end up in a mess. We don't know the instructions. We don't know the word. We don't know what God has told us to do. But if we are students of God's word, if we study it, truly give our lives to knowing this book, and it's not just for the pastor. It's not just for the deacon. It's not just for the, the, the uh, theology professor. It's for every Christian to be a student of and to know the Word of God. If we're students of this book, we don't have to worry that we'll be taken and led astray. We don't have to worry that someone will come and preach false doctrine or wacky stuff because we know what the Word says. To so be a student of God's Word. Number two, walk in the Spirit. Paul said, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. There's no allegory in that. 
It's very black and white. If you want to do what God has called you to do, you've got to walk in the Spirit. It means we're giving our lives over. We're yielding our lives to the Holy Spirit of God. We're yielding over to His leading. We're praying. And that's, I mean, that's another step, but we're, we're doing the things that God has told us to do, but we're depending on Him to help us do them. To walk in the Spirit is nothing more than to obey. I mean, it's interesting. You, you obey by obeying. I mean, that, but that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. Truly, that's what I'm saying. And when we walk in the Spirit, God helps us. When we're dependent upon the Holy Spirit, He strengthens us. He's that comforter. He's that guide. He's that instructor that gives us uh, our next step along the way. Walk in the Spirit. Allow Jesus and His Word to develop in your life the fruit of the Spirit. How are we... Oh, how are we faithfully obedient in all things? We become a student of God's word. We walk in the spirit. Number three, this is a good one, an important one. Find accountability and encouragement in the local church. Just like we're in a day and age where we have great biblical illiteracy, we're also in a day and age that downplays the importance of the local church. We think, well, I'm a Christian, and I can love Jesus without organized religion. I'm a Christian, and I can love Jesus without being in a church. I can go up to the mountains, and I can worship God. I, I mean, I hear that stuff all the time. And oftentimes, I'm in a setting where I do have to be polite, and I have to go, okay, that's, that's your opinion. But you know, inside, I want to go, no! Because the local church is a gift from God. Because in the local church, we find other believers who love Jesus and believe his word, and what they're going to do is they're going to hold me accountable, and they're going to encourage me. They're going to hold me accountable in that if I start stepping out of line, if I start doing something wrong, then I'll have people that love me enough to come alongside and say, brother, you're making a poor choice. You know, I've got, I've got an Austin and a Rick who will step on my toes from every now and then and say, no, no, pastor, you, you, got, you got back up here. I'll have accountability. I'll have people that will hold me to Scripture because they know Scripture. But I'll also have encouragement. When I come into church and I'm I'm pretty beat up and I'm tired and I just don't feel like doing right I just don't feel like walking in the spirit today I want to walk in the, I mean there are times where we, you come to church and you want to I mean you want to just live out the works of the flesh then you have that sweet brother or sweet sister and they can just see it they come alongside and they say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm praying for you. Can I take you out to lunch? Can we, can we just spend some time together? You can do this. We have Jesus. Greater is he that's in us than he is in the world. I'm praying with you. I'm walking with you. We can do this together. How are we obedient to the Lord? How can we live lives that are pleasing to God? Become a student of God's word. Walk in the spirit. Find accountability and encouragement in a local church. And number four, this is probably one of the ones that I know I have to work on the most, pray without ceasing. It's probably almost a cliche at this point, but I don't believe any Christian ever feels like they pray enough. I think all of us could say, I could, I could improve in the area of prayer. And prayer is one of these mysteries in Scripture. It, it puts us in a, a position of helplessness, doesn't it? Paul puts it this way, casting all our cares upon him, for he cares for us. When we come in prayer, we're saying, God, here is everything I'm worried about. Here is everything I'm trying to control but cannot control. Here is everything that's going on in my life right now, and I am giving it to you. Help me. 
And what's amazing about prayer is it's painted in Scripture as like this ultimate power source. This ultimate key. If we'll just utilize it, if we'll just use it and not forget it, great things can happen. I mean, think of the Think of the, the, the stories in the scripture where uh, God has done the most amazing things. They were always, uh, you know, preceded by prayer. The church went out on the day of Pentecost, preceded by prayer. Nehemiah builds the walls. He, he, he's, you know, he, he's preceded with prayer. Jesus himself, before beginning his earthly ministry, spends a period of 40 days praying and fasting. If the Son of God knew he needed it, we need it too. A pastor, you say, those four things you said are like the most basic things in the Christian life. I know. But I have to be reminded of them time and time and time again. I'm a knucklehead. I forget stuff. This morning, I forgot that my wife had made breakfast in a slow cooker and my son and I foolishly ate cereal. Yeah, we forget things, don't we? We're human. But we're humans who've been put into a special spot. We've been made holy. We're ambassadors for Christ. We're New Testament priests. Therefore, let's, lo- let's walk accordingly. Know your word. Walk in the spirit. Find accountability and encouragement in the local church. Pray without ceasing so that you might present your body, your life of a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Don't pull a Nadab and a Bihu. Don't just say, well, I know what God says. But I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to live how I want to live. I'm not going to be obedient. I'm going to be stiff-necked. No, no, you're going to find yourself up against a brick wall, spiritually. God doesn't tolerate that forever. Give your life to Jesus. Do these things. Very simple. Very dependent. Very powerful. Let's stand together. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. This is the invitation time. I've gone over about 10 minutes. And this is the end of the month. 